Oh man, that one was for the books, huh? It was. It was definitely an adventure, and it's one of those times that you're glad to be back on dry land, but then you kind of itch to go back out and do it again. Yeah, right. <laughs> so on episode three here of the Nordic Tug uh, delivery, we're aboard Perfect Two here. Uh, Phil's generously letting us uh, use the boat here, uh, and this is one that we're uh, getting ready for sale. I think he's going to. I think he's actually going to sell this thing this year. You know, you, you never know. But yeah, right. It looks it, like maybe. Yeah, <laughs> at least he's talking about it now. Anyway, we appreciate uh, him letting us sit here on the Perfect Two and talk about it. But today I really want to get with James here uh, to finish up this uh, episode three here. I didn't do a lot of footage that last day because you guys saw on episode two. We are, we're in the canal now. We had to make the decision to come in. So what I wanted to do is just sit down here with James for a minute and talk about that inside and the outside passage um, and what his feelings are and what my feelings are on going inside or outside on that run to Houston. Uh, there was some unexpected stuff for me. I don't know about you. I, I've never done it before. Have you done that? Uh, I've never done that route, no. That that was uh, definitely the New Orleans oil fields was the first time. Yeah. So it was, uh, you yeah. know, I expected busy, but that was busy. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, that, there just, and to me, it was there was no real time of the season. So even on the outside, it was very busy, I thought. Because mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. there was a lot, even at nighttime when you were on shift. And typically how it worked, uh, our first 24 hours, I think our shifts were perfect. And we pretty much knew, I mean, uh, the owner of the boat was, uh, he's in pretty rough shape. He was going through some medical issues, and so he was on um, uh, a couple painkillers. And, and he also, every seasick man. Yeah, man. every seasick man. Every enemy. possible seasick, seasick man. Mess, yeah, and so I don't want to say he was out of it, but he was, uh, he did, he, he took his turn at the helm. But, yeah, he did a few shifts at the helm. You know, but, got, we got some rack time because he watched. Yeah, but... Uh, Mostly it was me and James, and it worked really well because he would he would take a, that uh, I would take the early morning shift from let's say midnight to about eight o'clock in the morning seemed like then James would give me a a a, a, re a rest there for a little while. Yeah, then, we, that's we, when the owner would step in and give me. We, a couple we didn't hours. really have formal shifts because of the the short nature of the trip, trip and also yeah. the ever changing nature of conditions as things went on. Yeah. So we sort of just were uh, doing it live. You know, when, yeah, when right. somebody needed a nap, somebody else yes. covered for them. Yeah, and it worked really well. And typically that's how it did. I took that early morning shift from late at night till early in the morning. It worked really well. And you took, you Yeah, took and I was kind of working the swing shifts. Like I could go all the way till whenever you could get up, yep. two in the morning, whatever. Yeah, right. And in the meantime, <laughs> either one of us needed, but so we, we, we did start the trip on the outside. I'm going to share this drone footage with you as we're talking here because I think that drone footage was really it's cool. very cool. cool. Yeah, <laughs> James, we almost lost the and drone. Yeah, we earned it. I'll <laughs> link the video right here because we uh, I, I did a l quick little uh, video talking about how we almost lost the damn drone. I really wish we had a GoPro watching us recover the drone. Drone, yeah. Uh, that would have yeah, been, cool. been great footage. Yeah, that, was, that took all three of us to get the drone back on the boat. and It was a lot of fun. Uh, but we did get it. And uh, But there was a second there we all panicked and we thought we were going to lose it. We, yeah, we were considering <laughs> ditching the drone and well, just yeah, eating a thousand dollars. Not how you want to start a trip. <laughs> no. So anyway, uh, uh, I want to like my opinion of going from the outside. If I'm ever delivering another boat, uh, this is the first time. Me and James have probably I don't even know, I can't even count how many times we've delivered boats. But it's always been local, so it's only been and we're together. And we're always in the helm or, or down in the engine room or an electric panel. Uh, for for a day at a time, but we're both got our heads inside these panels, so we don't really uh, we're not communicating. Like we've never been on an overnight. Uh, yeah, not quite as much downtime to just chat and talk and reevaluate. Yeah, and, everything. So we had four days together. We kind of learned a lot about each other, and uh, you know, James is a stud. I'm just going to tell you ladies that right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so. Uh, the outside and the inside, if I'm ever doing the Houston run, I'm going to always push for the outside. I don't know about you. Agreed. But uh, I think re I, and I was of that belief before, and I think this actually reinforced it, ironically, even though things went bad and we had to deal with stuff out there. But I, I don't regret the going on the outside, no. and, I, and I, would, I was very happy to skip over New Orleans locks. Absolutely, because the, the boat, there's, when I got back from the, the, the voyage, um, uh, th there was a guy pulled in right next to me. Uh, he actually hurt one of his um, pods in in there somewhere on, on that run. Anyway, yeah, yeah, damaged running gear and kind of limped in here. And yeah. Anyway, uh, he said he waited for how many hours? Fifty. Fifty hours. Fifty near hours. our entire voyage. Yeah. So, and he said like the the locks the, the 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 toes were stacked up fifty deep. 
And of course, with the delay, more toes are showing up, and they have priority. So you're just waiting until there's an opening. Yeah, and so I don't regret that at all. It's and if you're going to do the inside and do the uh, the canal, you that's a, it can turn into a ten day trip real easy. I can see it because once you get past that, because we came in, so we stayed on the outside for the first uh, like thirty six hours. I would say it was three o'clock that uh, uh, that next day afternoon. Yeah, we were solidly twenty four hours. Then about three o'clock, that's when the engine died on us. And then we were back in by five a.m. That's when we went through the lock. Yeah, right? and w the only thing I would maybe plan differently a little bit, I would probably stay a little bit closer to shore. Maybe uh, that's that's debatable. I didn't see any crab traps out there. Maybe, but like. You know, two miles versus seven, it's not really much to be yeah, you're, you're still right. offshore, you're still, still in the dead there. zone where, you know, there's no tow. Yeah. So the one thing I would say, like, lesson learned is I'd like to uh, mark that dead zone of no tow recovery and then preemptively do things like change filters before crossing in there. Well, I'll never go back out in the Gulf again without and making sure that wh when's the last time that this fuel was polished? Yeah, for sure. Because even in one to two footers, when you so for you guys that don't understand what we're talking about here when you get out in even one to twos and threes which are really moderate out in the uh the big ocean uh you know you're still dealing with waves you know that tall and especially we're in a 32 foot boat something like uh this, this is a 50 foot boat we're on right right now it, it, it would tolerate two to three foot seas. Oh, it's gonna be some, like exponentially heavier this yeah, boat right. is probably like several times heavier than that little tub. yeah right and so it's going to be a different ride but you're still going to have fuel shooken around in this tank. There's no, sure. there's no way. And then what it does is it, it bounces around in there. Any algae built up or anything, it comes off, and then it gets uh, plugs up in the intake and plugs up your fuel filters. And I think what got us was that uh, we know that that the Nordic tug had been run regularly, re often. Yeah. But it just had never gone outside in years. Yeah. Right. So once we actually asked that magic question, like when was the last time this boat was in a real seaway? That, that was previous owners. That could have been 10 years ago. Right. You right. Know. And so, and then we asked uh, the, pre, the, the, the the current owner, you know, have, he's never polished the fuel and he would he couldn't tell us when the last time. So we're assuming that it was uh, dirty fuel. And we definitely had clogged filters. Yeah, and, yeah there's no and question. We, we even had the clogged pickup at one point where there was a vacuum on the filter housing when I opened it, it sucked yeah. in there. And so th the point for us is now we're forced inside here. So now we have the experience of the inside and the outside. I'm still a big believer and a component on that particular trip going to the outside because once we got on the inside here, and I'll share some of this footage with you inside that canal, it never let up. If you were oh, yeah. at the helm, uh, it's, it's suddenly a full-time job. Like you, you can't not be looking up for a second. Uh, and that's the downside of being on the canal and you're a second class citizen. All the commercial boats own that water. You got to get out of their way, you know. And and there's less autopilot. Like out, outside oh, yeah. there, you just set the autopilot, and you know, and you're constantly watching. There was a lot of traffic out well, there. It was just easier. You can do eight hours watching an autopilot, no problem. But eight hours on the canal in traffic is that. I mean, it's mentally tiring. Yeah, yeah. And we, we were able to use the autopilot. That autopilot wasn't working perfectly. It was the only electronic on the boat yeah. that wasn't working perfectly. And that what we're saying by that, some of them all have a wheel, or some of them you can adjust. Uh, just by uh, making your changes on, but that the starboard, the, the small adjustment buttons weren't reliably working. So we were what we were doing is standby, turn heading manually, and then autopilot. Yeah, and so that and got, that, that worked. It was fine, fine but, but it, it's just uh, hard to make fine maneuvers like that. Yeah, so you so you're constantly in the in the ditch, we'll call it. You were constantly driving that boat, and you had to be you were monitoring those radios, and uh, you know half the toes would talk to us, like James was saying. The New Orleans, this side, the toes were talking to us. The other side, closer to Galveston, they stopped being as responsive, and you know, busier area and more of a like a industrial ports. There's a lot of traffic going in, yeah. and a lot of recreational boats. Yeah. When we were the only recreational boat for 100 miles, everyone thought we were an oddity, so they wanted to chat. They yeah, were, right. You know. So anyway, but it was uh, the, the trip. You know, so we got to Galveston Bay there. Pulling into Galveston Bay, even going up that ship channel. I'm gonna show you a picture right here. This is this ship's coming up to me. Another big, big thing that you know when I did the loop, six thousand miles of loop. I never was in traffic like that ever on the entire loop. Uh, never. Would ever. you think the Mississippi would be busier? But that section no. was one after another. And, and maybe it was just the time of year I went through or whatever. But it was not. I'm telling you, James, it wasn't busier. That was the busiest traffic I've ever been in, and I. I have AIS on Southern Estate, but I can only spot them. I, I don't have the name because I, I, there's a couple of things we'd have to fix on mine to, to get it working. 
but I think I'm going to go having a true Ray Marine. I got a picture here of it, actually. I took it. And then you can see all the ship traffic and having that, that information all the time. That was key inside It, it was very useful. And also them, uh, like the locks especially, being able to identify us. So they were calling us by name, which was just helpful for us because then when we're not paying yeah. attention, they can be like, If hey, you're going to make that run and you're going to make the inside of the canal, you need AIS. It's, I it's, think it's, it's more valuable than you might at first think. Yeah, it's, right. It seems like a luxury, and it, it is. You can do it without it. But it's very useful, worth the money for sure, because you can do it cheaply. Okay, so this is just, I'm going to go with my opinion here. If I'm running this ever again, uh, I would almost plan exactly what we did, and that that, that uh, freshwater bayou would be my out. My And there was a good fuel stop there, too, actually. Oh, yeah, Shell Morgan was a great fuel stop. Yeah. And at an overnight dockage if you needed it. Yeah, if right. You to make a... And so I don't believe we made any mistakes. I would have... Like, if, if we could have trust that the algae wasn't good, we would have stayed on the outside. The weather, weather picked up on us a little bit, but it also calmed down, too, so we would have been fine. I think the key is that with all things on the water, there is no 100% right answer. Right. Every scenario is different and every is dependent. So there are upsides and downsides to the inside versus the outside. And obviously, one of the upsides to the inside is rescue and repair is available almost immediately. You really can't get yourself, other than running aground, there's nothing you can really do to get in trouble. But it is way less efficient, just in fuel, in time, in, in all of that. Yeah. It costs way more to go the same distance, and it's harder on you physically and like mentally. Yeah. Uh, the watches are intense as opposed to open water watches that are pretty easy. Um, there's no room to maneuver, so if you end up in a bay and you're taking them on the beam, you're just taking them on the beam. Out in the water, you can tack back and forth and adjust for that. Um, and of course, and your range is longer because you're burning less fuel because you're maneuvering less, you're changing power less. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of upsides and downsides to either. Everyone has to make their own choice in the given situation. But I really do think we found this like magic perfect route. If I was doing that run again, I'd plan it the way we ended up doing it live. Yeah, like, because you I'd got go out for you got past, past New Orleans. Get, get past New Orleans. So and if, it cuts out a lot of uh, the canal going up through Mississippi and all that. So you cut out straight line distance and you cut out locks. And then you jump in where it's easy. And it all depends on the boat, too. If you have a go-fast boat versus a slow Very boat, true. like that was a nine-knot trawler. Uh, if you had even a slower trawler, I mean, in my opinion, I'm, I'm going to try and run the, the most of it that I can on the outside and work my weather windows. Just because it's efficiency. It's yeah. it's more, your, your safety is more in your own hands, but you are spending less time, less money, and less effort to get where you're going. And if the people, if you're, and if you're afraid to be around that tow traffic, then... I don't know what to. Th it's it's, it's right. the to me it's the same risk. The risk of maneuvering around that tow traffic is the same as the risk of being offshore. It's really all about you and your abilities. Yeah. So everyone has to make their own choice every time, and no two situations are the same. So of all the lessons we learned from this, it, it really didn't give a definitive answer on inside versus outside. Yeah. It's I don't a, I don't think so. I think it's a personal choice. Um, and it's definitely I, situational and crew and you know if you've got a, a boatload of uh, of newbies that are all going to be puking on themselves and unhappy, maybe take the canal. Yeah, right. You know, But if you got a salty salty sailors on board, uh, go outside, you yeah. know? Yeah, if I'm doing a delivery, I'm going to probably try and be on the outside as much as I can. I agree. And definitely try and... Uh, it just saves money. It saves the owner money. money. It saves us, you know, us time, time. and hassle. So, right. so it's a good move if you can make it work. Yeah, but obviously right. it doesn't always work the way you want it to, as evidence. Yeah, right. <laughs> So anyway, I just wanted to finish up episode three here. I, uh, you know, for me it was an amazing experience. I love that 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 thirty two Nordic tug. Oh, just great boat. A beautiful. Boat. Really just, more impressed with it than I thought I was. Yeah, I, I loved the boat before, but now after handling, handling it, oh, it's is, just, is a solid build. It's it's for its size. It handles great. Oh, it's just and fast. Yeah. Nine knots easy. You yeah, know? yeah, and that was pretty easy with it, and it just it ran like a top, except you know like. Uh, but wasn't that wasn't the boat's fault. Pulp, I can't no. blame the boat for dirty fuel. But That's as far as we were in one to twos, constant. The, uh, one day we got really smooth seas, and then yep. even out there, I'd say it picked up to two to threes, and then occasional fours. And the, I thought, and, and at night coming in, when I was standing watch right before we were making it back to like inshore, we were in consistent fours on our port turn quarter. Yeah. And yeah. then I was because I was watching the shadow as they come past us, uh -oh. and they were definitely fours, and like we might have caught a few bigger. It's hard to tell yeah. in the dark. But like I did say, we did for sure surf over 14 knots. But so we gained, whatever that is, three and a half knots surfing one of those waves. So And another thing that was uh, pretty cool about this trip is I got to do a lot of nighttime. So and we don't mm -hmm. do that a lot. But it was, uh, I 
like even in the canals there, we'd go a, a few hours into dawn and a few not very not very far into it because it was very yeah just stressful. a couple hours before dawn, a couple hours it was after. after dawn, and it worked out really well. And we made good time kind of, even in the canal. I think we did what was our biggest day, a hundred and something. Yeah, it was over well over a hundred miles. Yeah, it was like a hundred thirty something like that. Yeah. We did in in one, one day, day so. which is a lot on the canal. Yeah, like it that's, is. That that's is. usually a forty fifty mile day kind of thing. Well, we did yeah. We did from where we stopped that last stopped all the way to uh, to uh, Quinoa Boardwalk. To, yeah, to Galveston. Yeah, Galveston. It was 130 miles. So, yeah, and we did that in one day, but that was leaving early, and then we got in right at. I mean, we had 40 minutes more. We were all the way in sunlight. So. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, I had a great trip. Thank you so much, James. Uh, you as the viewers, uh, uh, viewers of the tube, we do appreciate you guys. Uh, we can't make the channel without you. The channel is growing very, very fast now, and I love having the help of James, and even his wife helps, and, and Beverly, and and we have other people stepping in now. You see, we can do some interviews. Glenn and Laura's been here, so anyway, we thank everybody. We're going to get them on the road again. Yeah, we, we got, will. We got them all squared away, I think. We're James down to minor got a, stuff. Yeah. He we got, got the generator working Yeah, again. he's got the generator running. So, And I'm going to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with those guys here coming up next week, just before they leave. Yeah, that'll so. be cool. Anyway, appreciate it, guys. Remember, live life with no regret. We do. And uh, anybody has any questions, just feel free. I mean, even you can, anybody can email Lost Bay Helicopters, talk to James or his wife, or you guys can email me personally. Anyway, peace out. Live life with no regret. We do. And I hope you guys all enjoyed this Nordic Tug delivery. It was, it was, it was a really, it was, uh, the boat was just incredible. Great boat. Fun time. Yeah. No regrets. Yeah, no regrets. All right. Thanks, guys. Peace out. Bye.